everybody. Happy Friday and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Sinead DeFries, and this is our daily show where we bring you the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading the panel today is Mark Ellis. Welcome one and all to the best movie news show in the entire galaxy here from the Collider Studios on Skull Island. I am thrilled to be joined by two of the best film pundits, and this might be the tango in cash of movie talk, <laughs> but we're not going to get to them yet, Sinead. First, I want to remind everybody out there about this awesome contest we're doing that's going to take place down down in San Diego Way, a little thing called Comic-Con, and we are giving you and one of your pals a chance to win airfare for two, a hotel for two, badges for two, and we're going to give you $250 in spending money for the weekend at Comic-Con to spend on whatever you want. If you want to get me an Uber, I'd really appreciate it. <laughs> you guys can check out the link in this vid's description for all the details on how to enter the contest, or you can simply go to collider.com, and hopefully we'll see two of your shining faces at Comic-Con. Okay, Sinead, who's joining me on also, today's movie talk? Yeah, also here is our Director of Development and the host of Collider Jetta Council, it's Mr. Christian Harlaw. What's going on, guys? A lot of fun today. Mark, how are you? I am doing great. Christian, you look ready to go, and you look like you have something up your sleeve. <laughs> I sure do. If you guys didn't watch Schmoes last night, we made a very special announcement that you guys should know about here, a brand new show on Collider. Whee. That's right, we have a brand new show coming at you. It is called The Top 10 Show. And it is a show that had been going on a little bit, but we're going to put it on Collider and start to develop these top 10 lists for you guys to watch happen on the air. And one of the hosts of that show is here today. It is the outlaw, John Roca. What's up, John? What's up, guys? Thanks for having me back on. Dude. Very Thank excited. you. Yeah, truly excited. This is a great opportunity for us. Yeah, yeah. I'm so excited. Can you tell me, can you tell <clears throat> me and can you tell the fans yeah. a little bit, if they're not familiar with the top 10 show, what to expect on the first show, the show in general? Yeah, totally. We, we uh, Matt Nost and I, we, call, we host the show. Well, we do is we take our top 10 lists we pick a topic for the week based on whatever's coming out whatever's being released that week in the theaters we come up with a topic then we go separate our separate ways create our own top 10 lists then come back talk about it on the show and then create the show's final top 10 list at the end of the show and we do not tell each other our top 10 lists so it's a surprise every time and it's our personal top 10 lists i get it so it's, it's like for this week you'd, it, you could do like top 10 sequels because of course yeah. in theaters this weekend is the hard target 2 trailer finally <laughs> after all these years hard target 2 is coming back ladies and gentlemen okay Sinead, let's kick off with our very first story what do we got Rumors have been swirling for years now that Steven Spielberg had his eye on a potential West Side Story remake. And now, according to Spielberg himself, those rumors have turned out to be true. Spielberg recently sat down with The Hollywood Reporter for a lengthy interview revealing that he has, in fact, secured the rights to remake the Oscar-winning West Side Story with his Lincoln screenwriter Tony Kushner currently working on a script. Spielberg said it's no secret that the West Side Story remake is a longtime passion project of his and something he's hoped to adapt for decades, adding that he originally tried to get the rights 15 years ago. Although the script is currently being worked on at the moment, no casting or a release date have been set. Mark, what do you think about a West Side Story remake directed by Steven Spielberg? Okay, look, Sinead, I, anything that Steven Spielberg does is going to be fine and dandy, and I will be excited to go see it. West Side Story, it's a fantastic tale based on Romeo and Juliet. Spielberg has made great movies about sharks, and he's made movies that involve jets. I just don't want to see him do West Side Story <laughs> because I feel like Steven Spielberg. That was so good. So I practiced it for like three hours this morning. Thank you, Derek. Shower. I just my showers last three hours yeah. for various reasons yeah. we won't get into. I just think Steven Spielberg is such a talented, one of a kind storyteller that I like seeing him do bigger projects. This is me being selfish. But when he does something like the BFG, I get really excited. When he did something like Lincoln, I wanted to see his spin on that story. I feel like there's a lot of filmmakers out there that could handle the West Side Story property and do it justice. And Steven Spielberg is someone who I'd rather see his talents aimed in a different direction. That's me being selfish. If this is a passion project for Steven Spielberg, which if he's been trying to secure the rights for 15 years, gentlemen, it seems like it is, yeah. then have at it. It's just not anything that's going to get me out of the bed in the morning and singing and dancing. Christian, how do you feel about this? I love it. I know both of you guys are going to be skeptical about it. And where's your culture? I'll tell you what, because <laughs> what's going to happen here, look, we know that first of all, West Side Story remake of Romeo and Juliet. It's a, it's a, it was the modern day taking at the time. Maria! But... You want your big projects from Steven Spielberg? You're going to get it. You're going to get it with Ready Player One. You're going to get it with Indiana Jones. You're getting it. And this is, you sold me on passion project. When have you ever heard Steven Spielberg say passion project and it's been terrible? We know that the last couple of times he's done the big budget movies, 
they haven't been great. Like the, the not big budget. That's not fair. But the big blockbuster mm-hmm. movies because. Uh, he, since Indiana, I mean Indiana Jones Four, we all agree is pretty. Terrible. Was not a great, not good. Film. He hasn't. I mean, I liked Tintin. I thought Tintin was really good, mm-hmm. but he hasn't really had that big movie. People are hoping it's going to be a be BFG. I think it's going to be Ready Player One, and that's kind of his his way back into that. But he's doing these other passion projects really well. Now, whether it is a Lincoln, I liked War Horse. I know a lot of people didn't last night. People were crapping all over it. I really liked the movie, <laughs> but anyway, um, I like the idea if he wants to do this and with Kushner please I I know people are going to be skeptical oh who needs West Side Story I know it's Spielberg but who cares I think that's going to be the common thought but that's not me I think it's going to be phenomenal when it comes okay I'm not thrilled with it you clearly are let's turn it over to our own trusty Steve John Rocco what do you think about this news as a Latino I looked at this and I was like crop you Steven Spielberg but no (laughs) I took some time I thought about it some more and it was like yes if it's a passion project this I'm, I'm kind of going back the other way a little bit towards Christian because as I did more research on this when it came up as a topic, I'm like, well, if Tony Kushner is adapting, it's the guy who wrote Angels in America. That's a fantastic play. And I saw the adaptation on HBO. It was amazing. So if they're going to do that kind of level of dedication to the film and, and modernize it as they did in the 60s with the original, which won 10 Oscars, by the way, 1961, that's for Scott Mance. So I mean, <laughs> to see that it came up like that, to see if they will do a modern take on it now, I wonder if they'll keep it full Latino versus full whites. I wonder if they'll make it mixed. It's going to be interesting. And so for me, I think we're in good hands. And I can't believe I'm saying this with Spielberg and Kushner remaking this classic, which I love. And I own the collector's edition on Blu-ray. This is one of those films that my parents made me watch growing up as a Latino kid, because it was like one of these things where Latinos were the main person, main focus and all this jazz, even though not all the actors were. Do you think Maria could be Middle Eastern? Oh, that's Maybe. tough. You know, it, it's an interesting point you bring up. Because first of all, if Roca owns the Blu-ray of West Side Story, party at this guy's this weekend. Come on. Do you guys think it should be changed? That you should change the war and you should update it for modern times? Or do you think it, we should stick in the mold that we already had from the 60s version? No. This is why I know. Look, it's Spielberg. Yeah. It's Spielberg. If he wants to do that again, I mean, I... I think that it's funny because I didn't even consider that I yeah. thought maybe they would just kind of redo it and do a period piece and put it in the 50s again if he does that okay but if he makes it modern today and things the way that to reflect the way times are going right now right. it's Steven Spielberg he's, yeah. he's very good at that stuff and obviously very passionate about that stuff and we'll get a we can get a powerful message from that film even though it's being retold once again I just wonder if we're still going to get Bernstein and Sondheim's lyrics are we going to get new music are we going to get right. different takes on we're things we're going to get music well you know? yeah Yes, obviously, but I don't know if we're going to go do dubstep stuff or whatever we're going to go into or hardcore rap. Like, there's all kinds of possibilities they can play with. It's kind of weird to put Spielberg into that arena because he doesn't seem the most modern, on edge filmmaker about that kind of stuff. But who knows? It's certainly possible. Shade, would you be excited to see West Side Story back on the big screen? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I grew up in musical theater and I know this story very well, but I would love to and I think it would work as both a period piece or a modernized tale. I feel like it would be really cool if they made it more set in today's day. Yeah. It'd be really awesome. Yeah. Well, luckily, that's not the last show tune story we have on Movie Talk. <laughs> Let's hit me with another <laughs> theatrical classic. Yeah, that's right. From one musical to another, the long-anticipated Wicked movie is finally taking flight with Universal Pictures announcing that it will release the film adaptation of the Tony-winning musical on December 20th, 2019, bringing The Witches of Oz to the big screen once again. Billy Elliott director Stephen Daldry is shepherding the movie to theaters with producer Mark Platt. The adaptation will bring back composer and lyricist Stephen Schwartz with book writer Winnie Holtzman adapting the musical from the Gregory Maguire best-selling novel of the same name. Holtzman and Schwartz are also writing the film's screenplay. There's no casting info just yet, but Adina Menzel and Kristen Chenoweth originated the roles of Elphaba and Glenda on Broadway, both earning Tony nominations in 2004, with Menzel beating out Chenoweth for Best Actress in a Musical. In all, Wicked has earned 10 Tony Award nominations and three wins, becoming the fastest Broadway musical in history to earn more than one billion dollars christian thoughts on the wicked musical finally coming to the big screen i mean s- smart it should have come out a long time ago yeah. and to capitalize there there are a few musicals that when they're announced you go okay you can see like a chicago you, when, when those type of movies come out like th- that's going to do well you're going to hear them about them in the oscar picture and i think wicked is going to be one of those now i don't think that either um dina menzel or channel with is going to be in the movie it's just gonna be too late mm-hmm. for that time i mean we're looking at 2004 was when they 
really hit these roles and that's okay we can find new i give i this is this is a perfect time to find new talent uh, that maybe can pull off these roles and get known for these roles. Mm-hmm. I love the idea that Daldry is doing it. I love Billy Elliot. It's one of my favorite movies. I love that movie to see what he's going to be able to do with this property. It'll be exciting. And the fact that Schwartz is coming back and these other uh, writers are, it, they're, you got to bring back the right people. Don't just take screenwriters who, oh, I, I saw it with my with my wife or I saw it with my husband. I can do it. I can write it. It's like, no, let people who are really <laughs> close and attached to it. Like, that's what I, that's what that's I was lots of Hollywood That's what works. happens. It's, it is. It's like a cheap, if, if someone has a studio deal, a writer or something, <laughs> Then they bring him in. It's like, are you familiar with it? Yeah, I know the witch is green, right? All right, you got the job. Uh, so th- that doesn't happen anymore. Like, the, you, you have this team that has worked on the project. Yeah, I like the idea of it. Yeah, smart. she's green. She's got a hat. We, right. we got no picture. Oh, is that the witch, the west, the east? Who cares? It's a picture. You know, when this this actually got brought up on Twitter yesterday uh, when we were closing out movie talk, and initially I heard that they're going to do this, and I'm like, it makes all the sense in the world. I heard the release date December of 2019, yeah. and I'm like, well, maybe my grandkids yeah. will give me a ride to the movies like why is it taking so long and then i started thinking you know what we just had oz the great and powerful come out and some people liked it some people didn't it got a very mixed reaction Did maybe well, that's one yeah. of the things that is delaying this is they want to get away from that a lot like how andy circus's jungle book decided you know what let's take another year and just let all this jungle book mania which is warranted dissipate just ever so slightly so we can have our version come out and be true to the vision that we have for this yeah. wicked seems like something that should come out before 2019 i have no idea why we have to wait time three and a half more years what's your take Roka? yeah a i'm super excited for this i saw it twice when it was here rolling through in the pen at the pentagious at yeah. the theater yeah. yeah i saw it a couple of times it's, it's a fantastic show and i'm with you christian how is this not already a movie like it should have already because i think hamilton will probably be a movie within five years so there's yeah. no reason that shouldn't be a, a movie already so uh, this is interesting to me it's taking so but i think it's taking so long because i think they have ideas about special effects and i don't know what their deal is with the touring production companies and what they have to do because it's going to take away money from the people who go to see it in the theaters like i wonder if they have to work out all that out first before they have to put it in a theater put it in the movie screens i don't know that's but that's an excellent point yeah. is that maybe there is something in the in the contract actual obligation yeah. where we get to have our run throughout whatever city or whatever yeah. Wo- yeah. all over the world we're doing it then you can do it in theaters that yeah. seems like it would help everybody right and the musical- casting thing i think is everything though what you're talking about yeah it's Chris. casting it's also musicals it takes a little bit more time mm-hmm. it's just mm-hmm. because it is you think about just just the time it takes to coordinate it on the stage right and now you have to do that on film it's yeah. it's it's a production it takes a little while yeah plus if you're adapting it you got to figure out what songs are going to stay Absolutely. what songs mm-hmm. are going to go yep. you know not 1776 way back when is a great example like some songs stayed some songs didn't it just all depends when they transfer over how they're going to make it work and i think the, the casting is going to be everything. Megan, <laughs> Megan Hilty might even still be in contention at this point right. to play the Christian Chenoweth. It's a great yeah. point, Red Shirt. I appreciate it. <laughs> and I have an update on Hamilton, by the way. Yesterday, I claimed that there's an 8% chance I'm related to Alexander Hamilton. I opened an Ancestry.com account last night when I got home. <laughs> Not sure. Details to come. But enough talk about Showtune. Sinead, let's talk about film because it's called Movie Talk. All right. Snowpiercer and the host director, Bong Joon-ho, continues to form an amazing cast of actors for his next movie, the sci-fi pick, Okja produced by Brad Pitt's production company Plan B. In addition to adding Tilda Swinton, Jake Gyllenhaal, and Paul Dano, THR is reporting that Breaking Bad standout Giancarlo Esposito is in final negotiations to join the film. The story centers on a young girl named Miha who risks everything to prevent a powerful multinational company from kidnapping her best friend, a massive genetically manufactured pig named Okja. Swinton, who reunites with her Snowpiercer director, will play the head of the corporation, and her twin sister Hall will portray a zoologist and Dano has been cast as an animal activist looking to expose the corporation's dealings. Esposito will play Swinton's right hand man. No release date has been set. Roca, what do you think about the all-star cast set for Okja? Oh, this is great. I mean, I couldn't be more excited. Swinton coming back. Snowpiercer was such a fun film. Some people didn't like it. Majority of us did. It was such an interesting take. And to see her work in that film, see her as an... You just, every time you see her on screen, do a character that's kind of character but make it work and give it levels and give it depth. You're just so in awe of her talent. So to see her here being used again by this director, I'm so looking forward to this. Paul Dano, Jake Gyllenhaal, they 
it sounds to me like they're doing the exact roles that are in their wheelhouse and that we'll have no problem buying them. I'm excited for Esposito. I love that he's having this career renaissance lately with being the voice in Jungle, a voice in Jungle Book, showing up in Money Monster. You know, this is a guy that I've been a fan of since the Spike, Spike Lee movies in the 80s. So it's so great to see him kind of coming into this, coming into his own. So I'm super excited to see what they do with this cast. And the writer, I want to give a shout out to the writer because Ronson wrote Men Who Stare at Ghosts, uh, Goats, which is one of my favorite books that came out in 2004. And he's consistently written these books about exploring psychotherapy, these kinds of things, and exploring the internet, what the internet does with people in cyberbullying. So I think we're in good hands with, with this film. Absolutely. Christian, Snowpiercer yeah. is one of those movies where you watch it and it can just be a great action vehicle, but it has a lot to say about society. It's got a really good message about the future of humankind. Mm. This seems like it could be one of those <laughs> things as well. And adding Gus Fring, I mean, it makes me hungry mm. for Los Poyos Hermanos. <laughs> and it also makes me really want to see what this guy can do. I loved him in Breaking Bad and it was also great meeting him. Remember when we met him at Comic-Con? Oh yeah, he's uh, he's awesome, dude. Yeah. Just partying, like having a good time, like, very cool with fans, but he's a great actor. So adding him, it, this is a great cast. This is exciting because I, you're, you're right. That Snowpiercer was so much more than just an action movie. Yeah. It was, there was so much depth to it and it did, it made you think it's, it's dark. There was, it, it just puts you in these situations like, what human nature really is and what it can what it can do when yeah. pushed in those kind of uh, scenarios so but to add this particular cast and you're right John to have uh, Swinton back, back with him and teaming up I always like when you obviously knew it worked the first time you're bringing back someone that you worked with yeah. well she is a great actress fantastic actress and I love the idea that he's her right hand man mm -hmm. that scares me just hearing about it um, I, I yeah so I think this is a great cast and I'm really excited for it Tilda Swinton has like one of the her and Bryce Dallas Howard both for whatever reason I'm sure they're lovely people to hang out with in person but they just have that ability on screen to be so icy yeah. cold mm. that's exactly what it sounds like we need from this character so with Esposito being her right hand man it makes all the sense in the world I am very looking forward to this movie it may not be the huge blockbuster it may not be oh Independence Day is coming back Finding Dory it's a sequel but it's something to keep on your radar yeah. we promise you that all right Wendy Nope, no, no Wendy. I'll pump. What? I'll pump. Oh, hey. Okay, well, Not Cody Wendy's Hall, uh, a.k.a. <laughs> up him, as he is known on the Schmo Show, is going to be monitoring the chat room. So, Cody, you have a simple task. We talked about Wicked. We talked about the Snowpiercer, a director making a new movie, and we talked about, of course, West Side Story and Spielberg. What are they yapping about in the chat room? All right, for West Side Story, um, no one's, not a lot of people are really pumped for it. The only reason they're interested is because it's Spielberg. Um, let's see here. Mr. West says, if it's Spielberg, I'll watch it no matter what. Um, another person says, never saw West Side Story, so I'll tentatively buy this news just because of Steven Spielberg. Uh, for Wicked, a lot of like people not digging this. A lot of yawns, a lot of meh. But um, one per Bruce Heinrich says, Wicked, yes, need a good actress that can sing. A lot of people are also suggesting Anna Kendrick for the role. And for mm -hmm. Okja, um, a lot, uh, Kyle S. says, wow, great cast. I know nothing about this movie, but I got to buy based on this talent. And Ronald Dredge says, it's about time someone made a movie about a giant sci-fi pig. So. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's been a long time yeah. since we got Babe in theaters. Right. <laughs> now it's time for Buy or Sell. This is the part of the show where Sinead is going to present us boys with a topic. We will say whether we buy it or sell it and then yell at each other for a couple minutes. Sinead, what's up first? In a report from Deadline, Lady Gaga is in talks with Star in Bradley Cooper's remake of A Star is Born, for which he is making his directorial debut and will also star. Gaga tested with Cooper for the studio, who loved the results. This all came to fruition after things didn't work out with Beyonce, who was originally approached for the role. Cooper is producing the movie with his hangover director, Todd Phillips, through their joint effort banner, and Bill Gerber, who has been working on this remake for a long time with the draft by Will Fetters, reworked with Cooper. A release date has yet to be set. Mark, do you buy or sell a Star is Born remake with Lady Gaga? I probably would have sold this news before I saw Lady Gaga crush at the Oscars last year, you know, and because I'm, I, if you guys know my musical taste, I'm not exactly up with the kids these days. So I knew of Lady Gaga more as a celebrity than what her talent was. And when I saw her at the Oscars, I was like, really? She's going to come out and she's going to try to outdo Julie Andrews with the sound of music? Are you kidding me? And she was phenomenal. She was a revelation. So after seeing that, I'm a lot more open to Lady Gaga doing stuff like this. And I don't hate this idea. So I'm actually going to surprise myself and buy this. How about you, Christian? I'm not going to surprise myself and I am going to buy it because the fact that she is, I absolutely was 
judging her at the Oscars going, ah, it's Lady Gaga. She's going to go over the top again. And she didn't. But she was also, I don't, I'm not a big American Horror Story fan. I don't watch the show religiously, but I did catch the stuff she was in. <laughs> she is a natural performer. That's what she is. She's a performer. She really, she, there's a lot to her. That whether they're going to remake this movie. I can see the argument if someone says, I don't think they should remake this movie. Okay, fine. But they are remaking it, so let's deal with it. The story is whether or not we think Gaga is right for it. And I think that if they auditioned her, they thought she was the right person. She is talented. Can, they, can she listen? Can they bring her down to, to exactly what they need? I believe that, that they can. Because, if you, again, from seeing a different role, obviously, from American Horror Story, and then even seeing her perform when she's singing in her comfortability, she is a performer. She's a good actress. So I think it's a, I think it's a good choice. Roka, the fear with this <clears throat> is that it might be labeled as stunt casting. Do you see it as that, or do you genuinely buy Lady Gaga in this role? Well, no, I think it's not necessarily stunt casting because she is already famous. She's already a singer. It's kind of in her wheelhouse as a person. So it's kind of a smart move by her. I've read a couple of articles in the last few years where she really made a concerted effort to change her career from being wearing the meat dresses and the big, right. big uh, grandiose things coming in, coming into that peanut shell or whatever she came in. I like the meat dress personally. <laughs> I, I thought fair. the meat dress was a great idea. I just was hungry. So uh, what I saw, <laughs> so I think what they, what they did, what she's done is though, is like she's honed her image, she's changed her image, she's softened her image, she's become more sophisticated, more ladylike, the stuff she did with Tony Bennett, and she really made an effort to be one of these people that has the EGOT characterized of her career, which is the Emmy, the Golden Globe, the Oscar, and the Tony. She is trying to achieve all those. And so this may be her attempt at trying to get the Oscar. It's I'm not the biggest fan of the Star, of Star is Born as a project, because it's re been redone a couple of times, and it's not that interesting anymore. Marsha Mason and Judy Garland did a great job with the original. If you keep, if, I just don't see what the point of remaking this film is. However, this the question is, do I buy her in it? Yes. I buy her in it, and I think they will get her to where she needs to get to as an actress. She showed that she has chops in American Horror Story. We'll see if she can carry a movie. Yeah, Sinead, I know that you, you do TV talk regularly. Have you focused on her in American Horror Story, or were you a fan of Lady Gaga already, or not so much? Well, we actually haven't talked about American Horror Story too much on TV talk, but um, I have seen American Horror Story with her in it, and I think she's great. I think she's fantastic. And her whole over the top, her showing up in the egg, whatever, all that stuff, it got a little redundant for me, but I think that she, that's kind of her personality, and she's, she works in those dramatic roles, not dramatic in the sense of like genre, but like very showy, and she kind of owns the screen whenever she's on TV, like you have yeah. to pay attention to her. I think that she's definitely a force to be reckoned with. That's right, she's a performer, and was it, so was it a peanut, or was it an egg, it or was, was an it both? Egg. Egg. It was an egg. She was incubating. Oh. Duh. Oh. Egg, egg, eggs and meat. I get it, I get it, eggs and meat. Yeah. The yeah. building blocks of life. Yeah. Thank you, Gaga. You're welcome. All right, what's our next topic? Warner Brothers has released their newest trailer for Storks, the movie that revolves around the fan fantastical famed baby delivery service with Andy Samberg voicing the company's top delivery store, Junior. When Junior accidentally creates a wholly unauthorized baby girl, he sets out alongside Tulip, the only human on Stork Mountain, to make their first ever baby drop before his boss finds out. The film also features the voices of Kelsey Grammer, Katie Crown, Keegan-Michael Key, Jordan Peele, and Danny Trejo. Storks opens in theaters on September 23rd. Christian, do you buy or sell the new trailer for Storks? I'm gonna tentatively sell it uh right now i just you know september animation movie didn't really play in in the summertime so it's that's they're hoping to kind of catch the audience that maybe didn't hasn't seen whether it's uh what's coming out now dory and uh secret life of pets and I, the movie itself just seems like a, something like, like an ice age script that maybe ah, we're not gonna do this version of ice age why don't you guys take it it could be cute could be fun I don't know, right now it just didn't win me over. I didn't really get a lot of laughs out of it. How dare you invoke <laughs> the name of Ice Age on this innocent little project? I don't know yet, yeah. That is such a cute idea. The fact that storks, they used to deliver babies and all was well until the Kelsey Grammer stork decided to turn them yeah. into Amazon Prime instead of babies. That concept made me laugh. Can it be a 90 minute movie? I have no earthly idea. I'm gonna tentatively buy it. My issue with the trailer is that it really felt thrown together. Like, mm -hmm. that. I. Think 
think I gave a pretty clean explanation of what the story was, and I think I did a better job than the trailer did because you have wolves looking at babies, then we rescue them, and babies have a scent, and there's a stork, there's a baby, they're in a hot air balloon maybe, and then they're in an office, and it's like, what the hell is going on? They threw way too much stuff in this trailer. I buy it based on I think the movie is going to be quality. I love the voiceover talent that is involved in yeah. stuff like this. Obviously, you have your big stars. You also have our good buddy, Stephen Kramer Glickman, who's a huge, he's a great physical force to be reckoned with. He's a hysterical I'm comedian. rooting for it. I think it's going to be a surprise hit in September, and that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. How about you, Roke? Uh I sell it. I think it's going to crash and burn. I don't okay, th I think well. the, tra <laughs> I think hmm. the trailer, I mean, I'm, uh, you're asking my opinion. From the trailer, it's like another middling animation movie, which I've seen numerous times, and we see these things kind of fall apart and then litter your cable channels all the time with them just being reshown over and over again, and you see that they don't quite get there, and I think animation is difficult to do. It's very difficult to get right. It's very difficult. That's why the, we love the ones that do get it right. That's why everybody loves Pixar so much, because they do it, and they take it to a whole another level and I think with this film it's it, I like the concept I think the concept is very smart it's very topical yeah. the idea of you know it's almost like drones trying to deliver what you were saying Mark um, but I, I think it was cute but it wasn't quite like interesting enough to watch and I dig the voiceover talent Andy Samberg uh, uh, Keegan-Michael is that right Peel? Key and yeah. Peel are both in the movie Key yeah. and Peel are both in the movie mm -hmm. as the Kelsey Grammer yeah yeah Kelsey Grammer is great mm -hmm. he should do more voice work he's fantastic but I just thought the film the trailer made it feel like uh it's cute, but it's not going to quite get there, and it'll be easy endings as opposed to something really interesting and deep that we would enjoy both male, and, both kids and adults. Okay, so Sinead, they're storks, <laughs> right? And they used to deliver babies, but now they deliver packages, but they might get back into the baby-making business. That sounds cute, right? The idea is fantastic. This trailer sucked. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty much all I can say about it. Not a yeah. good trailer. Didn't laugh. Not one time yeah. did not laugh. From Mark. What's our next topic? <laughs> <laughs> Sony and Marvel Studios Spider-Man Homecoming continues to add to their Spider-Man Homecoming cast list with THR, rep THR reporting that Prometheus star Logan Marshall Green will be taking on a villainous role as a secondary antagonist alongside, alongside Michael Keaton's lead villain, rumored to be the Vulture. At the same time, Deadline reports that Silicon Valley standout Martin Starr has also been cast in a mysterious role that is yet to be revealed as friend or foe to Tom Holland's Spider-Man or Peter Parker. The John Watts helmed franchise reboot is set to head into filming later this month and the production is filling up its roster with exciting talent that includes most recently Donald Glover. They all join Marissa Tomei as Aunt May and Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man, Tony Stark, alongside newcomers Tony Revolori and Zendaya as the female lead named Michelle. With Laura Harrier and Michael Barbieri, Barbieri, hi I cannot talk, Barbieri in yes. unspecified roles. Spider-Man Homecoming arrives in theaters on July 7, 2000. 17. Roka, do you buy or sell the two mysterious parts added to Spider-Man Homecoming? Oh yeah, I absolutely buy this thing. I mean, I think they're great choices to bring that kind of gravitas to this film. Uh, I think Martin Starr's Martin Starr is fantastic on Silicon Valley, and he's been he's been fun to watch his career. He pops up in interesting places and does great work. I think Judah Friedlander was kind of kind of initiated this kind of niche, and then Martin Starr's really kind of taken it to a, another another level with his work. He's done numerous projects, so I'm excited to see what he does here. And if you if you won't have the beard, it'll be even more interesting to see what a character he's going to create. Donald Glover, though, is the one. That's the one that I'm like, people were cr uh, clamoring for him to be Miles Morales to his version of Sp to do his version of Spider-Man. I think he's going to have something to do with Robbie Robertson. I think he might be his son or, or what have you. So it's going to be interesting because they're casting a lot of younger kids to play what I imagine are Holland's uh, contemporaries in high school or whatever. And so you're going to have Donald, who's a little bit older, might be guiding him in a certain way. He might even be Robbie Robertson for all we know. So it'll be fun. I think they've cast the right people and this Logan Marshall Green I didn't think he was that great in Prometheus but I know I've seen him in Madame Bovary and I thought he was really good in that so these are the right kind of actors to put in this film to give it the weight that they want to give it but still have fun with it so yeah, I'm excited it, it, it's a tentative buy for me as well simply because it just feels like this movie's getting a little crowded you know I, all mm. I, I do not want to have Amazing Spider-Man 2 happen where I did not hate that movie as much as everybody else seemed to but it did feel like they were trying to cram too much stuff in there and it felt a little desperate I don't think I think that this particular, these two castings we're talking about today is indicative of that, but when you look at all the names that they've thrown in here, it's a lot of 
of rising stars, like you said, and some that we already know very well. And it makes me a tiny bit nervous. Having said that, I love Martin Starr on Silicon yeah. Valley. And maybe I'm going to have everybody hate me for saying this. Sometimes on a Sunday night, when I turn on Game of Thrones, which I enjoy very much, and I watch Game of Thrones, and then Veep and Silicon Valley come on, I sometimes have a better time watching Silicon Valley and Veep <laughs> than I do. Game of Thrones. Well, the different it's, tones. It's, <laughs> I mean, I just, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a great compliment, you yeah. know, because yeah. Game of Thrones is like so heavy and you cream. get to laugh a little bit. Yeah. It, it, it's ice cream after a nice meal. That's mm -hmm. exactly what it is. Yeah. Talk more. You're yeah. good at this. I would tell you that I am very, this is a huge buy for me. Mm -hmm. The reason I'm not scared is because I think they're very aware that they don't want to crowd the movie again. They've been through this dance before with the Spider Man project, mm -hmm. Marvel now coming in to help. This is it. You're adding talent. Anytime you're at, you're adding talent, you're helping the story, but let's do it in a way that we don't we don't necessarily know if they're going to have huge roles in this one. There's a long game here. Remember that there's a long game of where these guys might appear in another Marvel Cinematic Universe film or the next Spider-Man movie. Who knows where they're going to wind up, but to introduce them to further the story and further the plot, I think, is a very smart idea, and they're just adding recognizable talent but not like huge stars but people who are going to help further the storyline excellent point and now i'm glad that my buy is now a real buy not just a tentative buy yeah. breaking news guys i don't know yeah, if you we all got. were aware of this before we went going but we actually have tom holland in the studio right now oh, here we, we cut to him over there tom what <laughs> is everybody saying in the chat room about hear this your accent fellow castmates in the new spider-man movie as well as the other buyer sells today you know, people are really excited about my movie, guys. It's going to be a big process. Uh, let's see. Dan <laughs> Danny no Malpin says, bye, bye, bye. Although I hope they don't put too many antagonists in this movie. I don't want it overloaded. Uh, Antoine Farrell says, buy anything with the new Spidey. Can't wait. Uh, for the Lady Gaga stuff, Chris Robinson says, bye. Lady Gaga really surprised me in American Horror Story. Mm. Uh, for Storks, uh, a lot of people selling it. Um, A. Clay says, huge sell. And Mike Cat says, Storks, more like Stoinks. That's nice. all. I'll there see you guys go. later. That's wonderful. <laughs> Tom Holland, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yeah, wow. yeah, very nice. What a debut for not Wendy and not Tom Holland. And Spider-Man <laughs> is going to come out next year at some point. This year and this weekend, we have a lot of movies competing for the top spot. Sinead, what's going on at the box office? All right. Am I supposed to do this <laughs> intro? This is new. It doesn't really matter. I'll do it. I can now read it's it. time for box office. <laughs> brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. This is the part of the show where we're simply, but now, Sinead, you're going to have to guess your yeah, top five, gonna too. Gonna top you're going to be put in the hot seat. Okay, all right. We're going to guess our top five for the weekend. Look, you got the newcomers in Finding Dory and Central Intelligence. You have The Hangover mm. from Conjuring mm. 2, which did very, very well. Sometimes horror movies are one weekend wonders. You had Now You See Me 2, and you had Warcraft. Don't forget about Ninja Turtles Out of the Shadows <laughs> just yet. Christian, yeah. I'm going to go to you first. Sure. Your top five, sir. Um, coming in at number five, I have Now You See Me too. Mm -hmm. uh, I think number four would be Warcraft. Three is Conjuring 2. Two, Central Intelligence. And then one is Finding Door. Very predictable list. Yep. Very uh, mediocrely delivered. I am going to ask you. <laughs> I'm going to ask you for this then. Yeah. For, for you brought up Sunday's No, earlier. I'll do this at the end. The cherry on top. Yeah, the, the Finding Dory. How much is Finding Dory going to make? One, ooh, that's one, a that's a big start. One oh eight, woo! One oh eight for the fish that can't remember Jack Squat. Let's go over to Roka. Yeah. What's your top five? Sir? Uh, oh, yeah, I'll do it like Christian did it. Number five is actually Warcraft for me. Number four, now you see me too, is actually getting a little more traction than I anticipated. So I'm surprised by that. Uh, number three, Conjuring two, definitely. I think people are enjoying that film more than uh, people anticipated. Central Intelligence number two, because there's no way that's gonna you know just defeat Finding Dory. I think Finding Dory definitely number one by by miles and miles and miles. How much? <sighs> Good 131 million. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, no way. Man, 131 million for Roka, who clearly enjoys Maybe. Coors Light before lunch as much as I do. Sinead, let's go over to you. We need your top five and we need your number for Finding Dory. Oh, man. All right. Uh, mine's pretty similar. Finding Dory, Central Intelligence, Conjuring 2, Now You See Me 2, Warcraft. Yes. Okay. Uh, so Sinead with a little Sinead. switcheroo with Warcraft. So you agree with John Roka? Yeah. Yeah. Now, your number for Finding Dory? How dare you. I mean, I don't, I don't know Boom. how this, I don't know how to do this. You say a number, <laughs> and then the Will chat Basin. is already saying I'm asleep. You guys are making me look bad. Um, You're doing on. great. What are you talking about? Wait, okay, but I, I don't. I'm always so off in this because it's always way higher than I remember. Think. It's in a lot of theaters. Okay. It's going to be in in some of the. I released in more theaters than most of the movies this year. Okay. So where's the ballpark? Like I'd where say, does it I'd usually say $100 hit? Hundred million dollars would be a rousing success. And we haven't had a hundred right. million in a little bit. Okay. So. 
Um, I will say we're doing opening weekend the whole weekend. Domestic opening weekend. I will say 110. Mm. 110, 108, 131. Um, Look, sometimes I make predictions and I stick to them. Like I said, Cavs in seven. I'm sticking to that one. Oh, oh, man. I said Finding Dory was going to do like 79 million opening weekend. Yeah. And I wish I hadn't said that. I'm going to up that to 91 million dollars for Finding Dory. I think Finding Dory is number one. I think Central Intelligence is going to have an easy time at number two, around 45, 50 million dollars. At number three, I'm going to have Conjuring 2. At number four, I'm going to have Warcraft. Number five, I'm going to have Now You See Me 2. I agree Wait. with your list. So, uh, so you, uh, Conjuring 3, uh, you have number three? Uh, the Conjuring mm-hmm. 3 is okay. not out yet, but the Conjuring, <laughs> the Conjuring 2. Conjuring 2, yeah. <laughs> 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 right. Right. In theaters right. okay. this weekend. So those are our box office predictions. Make sure you guys tweet us and let us know, hey, did we get it right? Are we getting it right? How are the numbers looking on Saturday and on Sunday? And also make sure you check out the Finding Dory review that we did on the channel. It's up right now. I believe it was yourself. It was me, Dennis, and Perry. And then Christian and I did ours on Schmoes Know as well. Yeah. So all the Finding Dory spoiler-free content you can handle is on Collider Video and schmoes no and now we move on to mailbag this is a part of the show where we get to hear from you guys you guys can email us at any time and maybe Sinead will read it on the air collider video at gmail.com and at the end of the show we're also going to save some time for your live twitter questions tweet us anytime at collider video Sinead, before we get into the mailbag uh there's a big matchup coming up today and i know you haven't been live on hand for a lot of the schmodown matches any- but for, or for any of the anyway. showdown she's matches. The only, <laughs> she's the only host that has Maybe the one that the happens only host today <laughs> breaks that chain because we got a pretty good one against two contenders, that one of which is in the top ten. You have Gray Dre from Rotten Tomatoes yep. going up against Jason Inman, who was on the show yesterday and seemed pretty cocky and promised that he's going to bring something special to the table in his intro. What does that mean? Mm. We know nothing about him right now. So he, I, we know that he hosts DC Access. He knows comic book movies. But Gray Drake's done this like five, six different times. She is really good. She's... Uh, a big personality. I'm very excited for this match. For those of you who don't know them and you're like, oh, I don't know this. Should I watch it? Yeah, because it's going to be a barn burner with these two because this is going to start kind of shaping the top 10 contenders. Like one, one of them is going to be in the title picture pretty soon. That's right. R- Roka, I look at this matchup like yeah. Snowpiercer where it's not Civil War. It's not this huge, oh, you got to watch this match. This is this has all the stars in it, but this could be one of the better matches we ever had. What's your read? Who are you picking? Yeah, absolutely. I've known Jason for a while now and he's very knowledgeable about movies, more than just Star Trek, more than just comic book stuff so it's I wouldn't be surprised if he acquits himself well but somehow I just can't go against Gray Drake because Gray Drake works for Rotten Tomatoes you she would think logically stuff. she knows yeah. her stuff and I saw her on the on the team schmodown that the, that lady knows her stuff mm-hmm. so I think she's got a lot of intelligence inside there a lot of a lot of uh, knowledge of movies so I kind of leaning towards Gray Drake even though I love Jason to pieces I just think Gray Drake's got something to bring to the table that's uh-huh. right and Powerful. Christian and I are professional broadcasters we are the ones that are announcing the event so we can't really make predictions but I'm going to anyway i think gray drake has a better wider knowledge of film mm. i think jason inman is a wheel guy if he spins the right category on the wheel in round two he could be lights out but i think gray drake has some knowledge in every movie category you could possibly put on the wheel that's why i have gray drake slightly in round three over mr inman yeah i got drake by that much we are very professional we're yeah. so good at yeah. this real uh. quick makuga and i saw online that someone suggested that i go up against christian and we laughed our asses off <laughs> Hey, you know like, what? The it's, best match, it's got to be Sinead versus Christian. Why not? Are it you works. kidding me? Are you kidding me? TV. Yeah, right. Be I'd be out in like three and a half seconds. Oh, no way. Well, man, confidence, you wear it well. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to mailbag, something that we all know and we love talking about. What's our first email today? Kyle writes, hey, Clyder crew, love all your shows. Been a follower ever since The Road to the Force Awakens. I've been watching the Indiana Jones trilogy. That's right, trilogy, and I can't get enough of those great punch sound effects. My question is... Is there any sound effects that gets you guys all sweaty up to here in your favorite movie? Thanks again and keep up the great work. You know, I read this question and I think it's partially because I've seen The Force Awakens so many times recently and I'm a monster Star Wars fan. Sometimes they let me sit on the desk at Jedi Council. The TIE fighter noise that they oh, used yeah. and it was one of the early selling points of The Force Awakens when it's like, hey guys, Star Wars is back. You know why? Yeah, that TIE fighter sound, it just shot into your ears. It is so 
uh, identifiable with the Star Wars universe and with the TIE Fighter Screech. It's like, TIE Fighters, they're pretty expendable. It's like the Honda Civic of the Star Wars galaxy. You see them all the time, but the noise they make is so singular to me. It's one of my all-time favorite sound effects. Roka, how do you feel yeah, about this? I mean, if we stay in the Star Wars universe, anytime a lightsaber turns on, I just go nuts. Mm -hmm. Like, just, just immediately. It's there's that this, scream. Yep. Yeah. It's just the excitement of it all. It's just so perfect. Um, I would also slip into the Star Trek because whenever the transporter happens, I feel a little bit like I'm I'm it's I'm home. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I loved both these properties growing up. So whenever I hear a transporter sound, even in a trailer, I'll get like, oh God, this is so great, such great memories. And I would say the Transformers transforming on in the movies, even though the movies aren't that great, the sound they make when they're transforming is what you visualize and see when you when you watch the old cartoon. So for me, it's great to see that they they maintain that in the movies. I, I hate to agree with you, but there's a noise that the Transformers make when, like, if they're whooshing down the street as the vehicle, then they go. Oh yeah. It 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 sounds really really yeah. cool. Yeah. What do you got, Christian? Will, uh, a Wilhelm scream. Uh, it's, it's it's fun to hear. It's like it's almost like where's Waldo, but I think um, I, you took mine. The Tie Fighter is 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 mm. some of the best sounds. Like I, I get excited when I see one because I know I'm going to hear the sound. And the way they did it in the Force Awakens when Poe and Finn are escaping, and the way it just I look forward every time I've seen that movie. That's a moment I'm waiting for because I love the sound of it in Rebels yeah. when I hear it. It's that sound of the Tie Fighter. The sound design in the original Star Wars in general is just uh, I don't know. It's was, it was, it was groundbreaking everything they did, and absolutely yeah. the lightsaber. But um, yeah, a lot of them come from Star Wars. I, I'm willing to bet that J.J. Abrams' doorbell at his house is a Tie, tie Fighter. fighter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'll throw it over to Har for a minute for our friends at Collider Nightmares. I'm going to say when Freddy Krueger, there's a sound that his claws make, or that is oh, yeah. that the not the blades make on his glove when he's just like teasing the teenage kids mm -hmm. and he's just running it down the wall yeah. and it just it really it gets into your spine particularly in new nightmare Whew, good stuff okay <laughs> what's up next Sinead? jason writes greetings collider crew thank you so much for what you guys do you're the best in honor of father's day which is also the same day as my birthday this year Yay. happy birthday i was wondering what is your favorite movie memory with your dad star wars star wars will always be one for me but my all-time favorite movie memory with my dad is when he brought home braveheart Gladiator and The Patriot from Blockbuster for my brother and I to watch with him as our first R-rated movies. This was big for my brother and I as our dad is very strict and he would never allow us to watch anything R-rated growing up and the films all became some of our all-time favorites to this day. Keep up the great work guys and keep bringing on the filthy. P.S. Christian, if you could say happy birthday in Arnold's voice, it would be the coolest birthday present ever. <laughs> well, Jason, I have to tell you something. Uh, happy birthday to you, and it's very nice that your father did that for you. The fact that he came in, he bring the brave heart, he swings around the sword, he does all that stuff. I like it. It's nice. But I tell you, the other thing that I think is very fantastic <laughs> is for me, or my father, what did he take me to see? The Back to the Future. He has, a couple times, he had only seen it once already. He sees it again. He says, he sees it with me. I said, that's fantastic. Next thing you know, he's looking at the DeLorean. It's going fast. It goes 88 miles an hour as fast as you possibly can. Who knows who could do that? Back to 1955. Happy birthday. Get the cake. <laughs> I, that was uh, a hell of a performance. Uh, I, 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 I think you might have muddled the question. Um, was that Arnold's dad that took him? Is that like a famous story? That Arnold was this big movie star from Terminator and his dad's like, hey, Arnold, let's go see Back to the Future. Or was that the Christian Harflop experience? Uh, I, I mixed it. I mixed it. <laughs> it was very good. Yeah. Your dad, so you saw, your dad saw Back to the Future. He'd seen it already. My dad never sees movies twice in theaters. Like, once he's done it, it's fine. He was so excited to see that. I don't know, it was like six or seven, whatever it was. And he was, he had to take me to see that movie again. And it didn't matter. Like even, even the fact that that the, at 80 miles an hour, you're going to see some serious shit. He, my dad knew it was coming. He was like, watch this. And I was like, six. He's like, watch this. And it was because that it's that particular movie. Um, they just did something. It was magic. And it was, I always remember that moment with my dad. That's right. Uh, Roka, Father's yep. Day, very emotional for guys like you and me. Yep. What is a great mm. Father's uh, Father's Day or movie that you and your dad shared? Well, first, happy birthday, Jason. Second, I love this stock photo of them pointing at God knows what. Uh, but the third thing, <laughs> the third thing I would say is, mm. uh, here's the thing. <laughs> me, personally, uh, you know, I, my, I, you guys have heard me on the show. Like, my dad passed away in 2008. The thing we always did... Uh, at Christmas was when I would come, I came home every year, no matter where I was, come home every year, 
and we would watch the Godfather movies. One and two, three doesn't exist. One and two, <laughs> and then we'd watch it, Scar and we watch Scarface. That is what we did on Christmas Day, my dad and I, and that's some of my favorite, because he loved those movies. And like you, Christian, my dad did not watch multiple movies. I knew a movie was good when my dad didn't fall asleep in it. That's right. when I knew he liked a movie, because right. he, he would fall asleep you know, in certain movies. And so for me, Godfather was the one we would sit and watch yeah. all the time, because for him it really spoke to the epic of America, and he's an, he was an immigrant here, you know, and it was very, like I was like Sonny, because I was very temperamental my brother's like michael he's very chill and uh, you know, my sister was like so he he could relate to that with his own family and we could watch it together and just see the progression of the family and it was so much fun and uh, i miss it i miss watching it with him it's not it's never been the same oh yeah, yeah i mean sharing it with your old man is second to none in my opinion and i was lucky enough to give my dad a great theater experience partially because i planned it and partially because i didn't know this was going to happen but earlier in the year as i told the story yesterday for my birthday he thought he was going to go see apollo 13 is going to be a big family thing but i want to see a naked lady too bad so i dragged the family to go see species <laughs> so later that summer we ended up going to see apollo 13 it was mm. me and my dad were sitting in the theater and not only did he really want to see apollo 13 it's a great movie but before before, during the trailers, the first trailer they showed was not a trailer for a film, it was a trailer for the Beatles anthology, the TV oh, yeah. special that was coming out in three parts, like the next month or whatever, and he lit up, he was a huge Beatles fan, and he lit up, and we're like high-fiving before even Apollo 13 starts. It was a great time that I will never forget as long as I live. Another quick one is a multi-generational one, because anytime you play a comedy that's popular with the kids, yeah. you worry whether your dad's gonna get it, or whether your grandfather's gonna get it. Three generations of Ellis men. Pop up, my dad and myself and a bunch of other family members sat down to watch There's Something About Mary right when it came <laughs> out. On and we were nervous. The kids were a little nervous about the hair gel scene, about a lot of other things that happened in that movie. From the time that the zipper goes up and it doesn't go quite the way Ben Stiller planned it to, my grandfather and my dad, I've never seen them howl that hard mm. watching a movie. From then on, it was one of the great comedy experiences the Ellis family ever got to share. It was awesome. Happy Father's Day yeah. to all of the dads out there. And Thanks. our own Christian Harloff, who in fact claims to be a father to many people all across the world. Hey, well, it's good for taxes. We <laughs> hope you get your checks. <laughs> a new father. Yeah. <laughs> Let's move on to some live a Twitter question. Sinead, you got a few lined up for us? I do. Who are you? All right. Ethan <laughs> tweets, can an actor be nominated for best actor for voicing an animated movie? Can an actor be nominated for best actor for voicing? I don't believe that that's... I think you can. I just don't think it's ever going to happen. I don't think in a million years it's ever going to happen. Yeah, that's I'm the not same argument with Andy Serkis, I think, too. I, I, think, I think performance or motion capture would happen before Agreed. a voiceover one because they are taking your facial movements and transferring that into something else that looks like an, an ape or an orc or whatever the hell it is. I think with voiceover acting, there's just such a not to discredit it at all, but... I think that the Academy looks at that as an element that goes into acting. So if it's like I gave a dynamite voiceover performance, but Roca is actually there and it's him and his skin, you get to see his facial intonations, the way that he moves those eyebrows that he clearly adopted from Elliot Gould. There's some way that he is going to get the tiebreaker every time, and I can't do that. <laughs> Roka, yes, that was really good. Thank you. Well, as a, um, I host the podcast on voiceover uh, cast of characters, which you can find on iTunes. Um, it's a difficult question because the animation would have to reach such a high level, and like what Final Fantasy started, and what you see progressively, like we see with Robert Downey Jr. in uh, in uh, Civil War, you see the younger version of him. If they were able to achieve animation at almost a lifelike level, which Good Dinosaur kind of did with their environments, then I think it's possible because the voiceover animation would, would be uh, accentuating that and the performance. There are, you could argue there are multiple performances in uh, Pixar movies that break you in half because of what the actor is doing behind that mic. And, and it's really important to understand the level of performance. You are still an actor. And that's the thing that we talk about on the show a lot is like, there's no difference between voiceover acting and acting other than the physically being on camera. But the work you do behind that mic is just as powerful, takes just as much out of you, and takes just as much effort, regardless of what Chris Rock said at the Oscars, which was crap. The truth is a lot of the successful voiceover actors do a lot of research, do a lot of character work, do a lot of stuff to create, especially in the movies, create the characters that they're bringing to life because you love them, not because the animation is great, 
only you love it because the performance is fantastic i totally agree with you christian i remember this argument came up and maybe just some people wanted to cause a little bit of controversy or maybe see a different point of view when they were talking about scarlett johansson's voiceover in her mm. when they're like she was so yeah, good so good yeah. that maybe she should get some award consideration how do you feel about it well that's that's where i was going to go with the fact that it's possible mm -hmm. because of that alone because that's she's still doing a voice if you never see her face she's not a, a human character mm -hmm. So I just think that the problem is it's hard enough for an animated film to get nominated for best picture, not, not just best animated picture. That happens now. It's certainly happened before, but it's hard. a lot of people thought Inside Out should have gotten mm. nominated. But what you never hear is that Amy Poehler is going to be up for best actress inside. The, they don't even have a best acting category for animated. Yeah. Like they have the best animated picture, but they don't have that. I think that would be the first step is giving awards to the voice actors on their own category. Mm. That should happen first, because if that happens, then you can start having the same kind of conversations that like Inside Out did. Well, it was good enough, it should have been nominated, or you know, again, Amy Poehler was so good, she should at least be nominated, but there's not even a single category for them. That needs to happen first. I think it's, it's something that should happen. I agree with John 100% that there's so much to voice acting, there's so much to the characters that, that they have to do, and, and even when we talk to the characters for Rebels and, and what, these what these actors do and how they have to, they, they become the characters. Characters. They become the same way that an actor, when he goes on set and does, or he or she goes on set, live action has to really get into the mindset of the character. The voice actor has to do the same exact thing. But I do think you're right, as where performance capture is going to be recognized first, because the argument is there more that it's almost, it's getting close to, it's the same thing mm -hmm. with live action. You know, with you're, you're there, you're on set, you're doing... I hope that happens. I hope that the voice actors do get their own category, though. Well, if the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences is watching right now, these guys have a great idea for making your ceremony four hours long. Sinead, what's our next question? Muhammad tweets, <laughs> if Suicide Squad succeeds, then do you think Sony will re-greenlight the Sinister Six movie? That's an interesting question because when you look at how successful Deadpool was, because, mm -hmm. oh, it's this R-rated superhero movie and it's really funny and there's a lot of action there. We got to make every movie like that. You heard a lot of that talk that we can go and make other films R-rated. So if Suicide Squad becomes successful for having these anti-heroes or these villains that are on screen for the majority of the time going on a mission, it certainly opens the doors for a lot of other comic book possibilities that have a similar tone. Roka, what's your read on that? You're making a lot of yes, facial sir. intonations <laughs> that we would not have seen if you were merely a voiceover so, artist. Uh, boom. Yeah, uh, I would be surprised if they rebooted it or restarted it because there's such a negative connotation for a lot of comic book fans about the Spider-Man uh, reboot and uh, especially about Spider-Man 3, the Tobey Maguire stuff. So you, you start to attach these kind of negative connotations to Spider-Man. We want to see a new Spider-Man. We want to start over again with Tom Holland. They did such a great job with Civil War. If you reboot the Sinister Six and you keep it in the same studio, we're going to start to be like, oh, are they, what are they going to do with it? Are they going to really do a good job? I think if DC does a good job of Suicide Squad, they should tentatively take it slowly into the next phase. But I think with this, I, I don't think I'd be that excited to see a Sinister Six. Yeah, Christian, people who read a lot of emails last year said, hey, it looked like Sinister Six was something that Sony really wanted yeah. to do. Do you think that it's going to be contingent upon Suicide Squad's success? No, um, but I have been agreeing with you the whole show, and I disagree with you tremendously. Oh, okay. no, we had 51 I think, good minutes. I think Sinister <laughs> Six is going to happen. Okay. I think it should happen. I think that they can do it in a way now that ties into the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and I'm glad that they didn't do it during that mess because then you would have really heard a potential even that movie would have been great as you're tying it into a franchise mm -hmm. with and Andrew Garfield we all agree was a good Spider-Man but the mm -hmm. second movie used to, and it basically collapsed the the whole entire Sony slash Spider-Man union and it would have been a travesty to have and I believe it was wasn't it Derrickson that was supposed to do it mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so Derrickson doing that movie there and it was a great standalone movie and tied into that but now you have the possibility of I agree, though, take your time with yeah. it. Let's establish Tom Holland as Spider-Man, establish a couple more things, and then you want to spin it off and include that into the Marvel Cinematic Universe? That's what you can do now. So I think that with all hands on deck, I think it's good. As far as it being related to Suicide Squad, no, because Guardians of the Galaxy is still out there. Guardians of the Galaxy 2 will, will do well. I know it's it's, it's different in, in tone. With, you got more villainous mm -hmm. with, the, uh, with Suicide Squad, but no, I don't think so because I think it's just two different teams running both properties. I think you make a great point because if we're going into the Marvel
Marvel Cinematic Universe, then I have more faith in them. Right. I was operating under the the other mentality. That it was the it was it Warner Brothers did it. It was, it was Sony. Sony, Sony, did Sony did it. Sony did it. Yeah. I was operating. If they were going to handle it, I don't think I'd have enough confidence. But if going to Marvel, then I'd have a lot. Well, that more property's confidence. there now. You know, that's yeah. so, so because that's the, we had this question on Movie Talk I think last week it was like, mm -hmm. will these be kind of standalone? And it can't be because right. it it ultimately connects into the Spider-Man universe and Marvel made that agreement with Sony that those movies tie into the Marvel Cinematic Universe that we've been following since phase one. Yeah. So they're going to be very protective of Kevin Feige and everyone is going to be very protective of what Sony wants to do with it. So if Sinister Six is going to have their own standalone movie, it's going to be involved in the, in the MCU. So I'm excited by that possibility because it also gives us more to work with than the other stuff that we've had. Agree. Point, counterpoint, an uneasy alliance has been formed. It brings a tear to my eye. Let's do one more Twitter question, Sinead. <laughs> All right. Luke says, what would you guys think of a Breakfast Club remake? Kids are so different nowadays. Oh, man, kids no. might be different, but they're yeah. also awful monsters a lot of the time. And uh, I don't know that a Breakfast Club <laughs> remake is something like... John Hughes properties and things yep. that were coming of age in the 80s. It's such a special time that I feel like, even more so than superhero movies, where, oh, we want to get a different take on Batman. We want to get a different spin on Spider-Man. It, there's just something about it. I don't have a problem with making a movie about a school in the modern age. And there's kids that come from different walks of life and they're thrown into a room together and have to resolve their differences organically. But you don't need to call it the Breakfast Club. Yeah. You don't need to do it because it feels, first of all, it hurts the new movie because it's got to live up to that lofty standard. Second of all, it's going to piss off us old people for saying, that's not the breakfast. That's me. That might be the brunch club at best. I don't like that idea. I feel like the Breakfast Club, and it's not one of my favorite movies of all time. I don't have a poster of it on my wall or anything, but it just seems like sacred property that I don't think you should touch from a marketing standpoint. Do not put the Breakfast Club on a new movie poster. That's my take. Yours? Um, real quick, just a quick correction is that it was not not Scott Derrickson. It was uh, Drew Goddard who was supposed to be doing uh, Sinister Six. Um, going into, yeah, I agree with you. It's for me. It's not necessarily the remake of Breakfast Club that I go. Uh, it's that movie is a classic, and classics have been remade. We know that, and it's to also sometimes to reintroduce to new generations. Now, not that this is the same level. I love the first Vacation. I talked to Sinead. Sinead liked the remake of Vacation. And when I we didn't talk, hate it. But the thing is, when I talked to her about it, is that she had never seen the original. Mm -hmm. For her generation, didn't really hadn't seen the first movie, so she had nothing to compare it to. Now, a lot of people might not have it to compare, but the difference is, even though in a Harold Ramis, um, you know, who had done the first vacation yeah um a genius brilliant filmmaker but john Hughes was something else john Hughes was the star of breakfast mm -hmm. club not those kids they're all great but john hughes all his movies whether it be you know the the uncle bucks or yeah. what at all of his movies that he's done ferris bueller there's something about it there's a magic you don't want to touch it i wouldn't want ferris bueller touched mm -hmm. and i don't think this movie should be touched i think that you can do it with the generation that i get the point but i just you're not going to get the magic you're just not going to do it you might get some good actors in there involved but it's just it's just very shaky ground to try to touch that movie okay roca i i i, I i'm guessing i know your take on this but i'm gonna put the pressure on you sure sell me on why we should have a breakfast club remake. seriously you won't be able to do uh, it. I, uh yeah i don't have the words for it i really don't yeah, because it should not exist i think what christian said is correct this is a great that's a great thing you said christian john hughes is the star of all the films that he made because his sensibilities are in there his his uh, vulnerability combined with the real take on people, even planes, trains, and automobiles, even the lesser ones like Some Kind of Wonderful still have his, his take and his vision in the films and they make you connect to these characters because they make them universal and relatable and you remember growing up during that time. The thing is, it's like the Uncle Buck TV show that's out now. Why call it Uncle Buck? Just make a TV show and call it a different name. We don't go like, oh, let me go see Uncle Buck in another version. You don't need to do it. Same thing with Breakfast. You don't need to do it. Make Do a film about teenagers coming of age into tension with a crappy vice principal trying to figure out their life stories with an abusive father with a geek with a jock with an uh, you know a, a shuttered girl and a princess do all that stuff but just don't call it the breakfast club it'll work if you have the right writers and you have the right sensibility on capturing the kids nowadays like uh, Shanae, if she saw vacation and loved it great because you didn't have the other one to reference 
it didn't even have to be called Vacation. It could no, have just been something, been something else. Well, here's yeah. the thing, though, is that I, I do understand why you try to remake or reboot Vacation, because that was a family road trip comedy, even sure. though it had a lot of raunchy stuff, and it was about but a family. Re- it wasn't even a remake. It was a sequel. I, I really. know. So if you're trying to continue yeah. the family lineage of the Griswolds, I understand the effort. I'm not saying the movie did it brilliantly, mm-hmm. but I understand the effort. Sinead, as a high schooler yourself, do you <laughs> want to see <laughs> The Breakfast Club be remade? Do you think it would work, or is it something that you feel in your young age should not be touched? <laughs> Well, you know, since I am in high school, this is really easy for me to answer. Um, Honestly, I feel like it's so weird because I honestly feel like The Breakfast Club wasn't that long ago. Like Mm. when I think of movies uh, that are being remade and things like that, sometimes I'm like, okay, like I can see how a remake for this would work. But for some reason, The Breakfast Club still doesn't feel like there's been enough time. I absolutely love The Breakfast Club Mm. and I agree 100% that it should not be touched. I just don't think, I think you could call it something else and do like a different movie, but you call it the breakfast club. It's not going to, it's not going to fulfill. It's not going to reach its expectations. It's not going to have the same magic. Like Christian said, Mm. and the movie is fantastic. Just leave it alone. It does feel like not a lot of time has passed since breakfast club, maybe because it is time less and we are out of time here on water movie talk. I want to thank everybody behind the camera, helping us out, pull off this operation day in and day out each and every weekday. And I want to thank the gentleman and the lady, on the panel with me. First up, Mr. John Roca. Tell us about that new program you got. Hey guys, yeah, uh, please. Oh, uh, We're gonna start on June 29th, the Top 10 Show here on Collider Network. It's gonna be pretty awesome. Me and Matt Nost talking about Top 10s. Hilarity, hijinks, and antics What's the first one? will ensue. It'll be the Top 10 Steven Spielberg movies because of BFG coming out that weekend. Uh, so we're looking forward to talking about all that. And yes, we will enrage you, we will make you laugh, we will make you happy, uh, and you will throw your cell phone at the screen. That's just part of the thing with about the <laughs> top 10 show uh a red shirt guy promotes it so it's very good and uh you guys can always follow me at the roca says uh all twitter and instagram you'll see all the shows i'm hosting on all the shows i get to be a guest on like this very nicely done indeed and mr christian harloff we know we got the schmodown later on today where else can the kids find you well you can find me twitter and instagram obviously mark mentioned schmoes no go on over there and subscribe if you haven't done that already we did our live show last night and yeah the schmodown gray drake versus jason inman goes down today 2 p.m ps it's going to be a battle, so check it out. And you know what? I should talk about this as far as the Schmodown goes. For those of you who didn't know, we're actually there's two things that we're going to be doing. The, the team league uh, is going to be starting up in August, but we're also going to be doing the the tournament, the Ultimate Schmodown Singles Tournament, Ooh, to where it's going to be the top, the top eight contenders will be playing against one another, and the winner will get a shot at the champion at the very end of it. And that will be happening. More details on that to come, but just wanted to kind of set you guys up for it. And it's all more opportunities for Miss Sinead DeFries to get involved in the Schmodown. Until that day happens, where can everybody find you? Well, apparently I'll be on the new season of Teen Mom, so you guys can find <laughs> what? me there. Wait, what? Um, but no, I'm online at Sinead DeFries on Instagram and Twitter, and at that so she com on mondays i'm here hosting tv talk on fridays i'm here hosting movie talk and you can find me on mailbag over the weekends she is a great sport and over the weekend if you guys want to go see a movie the best place to go for all the box office and showtime information is simply amctheaters.com also check out collider.com for the latest in movie news that's where we get a lot of the stories we bring to you guys every weekday and of course subscribe right here collider video on youtube as for me i am merely mark ellis at mark ellis live and tonight and tomorrow night i'll be at the ice house comedy club in pasadena in the main room telling jokes and somehow trying to stay awake after the epicness that is today's movie trivia schmodown that's all for us have a great weekend everybody happy father's day bye hey guys if you like this video click the thumbs up button also make sure you subscribe to our youtube channel it'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at collider